Hello everyone and welcome back to the Capsule in Conversation. I'm Natalie Anderson and today I'm talking flexing, funneling out negativity and future-proofing your mind with author, podcaster and entrepreneur, the awesome Poppy Jamie. So settle down, turn us up and get ready to join in with our conversation. Hello, you lovely lot. I hope you're all well and have been enjoying all of our self-care September chats over on Instagram and here on our podcast. I have definitely had some real moments of enlightenment and I'm so grateful to all of our fabulous guests for joining me. So thank you everyone so far. And carrying on the conversation today of how best to protect our well-being is a woman who has lived and breathed the harsh reality of burnout and is making it her mission to help others understand themselves better to prevent them from going down the same destructive path. As the founder of the Happy Not Perfect platform, she joins us today brimming with helpful advice, tools and tips. So make sure you're sitting comfortably as I welcome the gorgeous Poppy Jamie. Hi Poppy! Hi! That was such a nice introduction. You've got such a nice, like lovely, calming voice. Oh, really? I I think I'm a bit northern. (laughs) So I think it's a bit, I don't know. But thank you for that. You know, and thank you also for joining me. I'm so thrilled to have you with me today. It's lovely to have you. I've been reading your book. And so I have to say, if I'm a little bit familiar, I'm so sorry. It's because A, I'm probably fangirling and B, I feel like I know you so well because I've read your book and you're so honest and I literally think, oh my God, we could be friends. You definitely get me. You're you're, like my head and your head is similar. Do you get that a lot? Um, That is just the nicest comment. It's, it is funny because obviously I was so honest in the book. It was, I kind of wrote it as as if nobody was ever going to read it. And, um, but I have to say it has just given me the nicest conversations with people because you just can't do small talk because everyone's like all right I know what you've gone through and Mm. so and then obviously then kind of shares with me and it's just really nice to have that kind of that kind of conversation with people where you can just be really honest so yourself and you just get to know people really quickly because they already know all your trauma. <laughs> oh, this is it. And, and you know, your trauma, like, you know, your book itself, it's here. Got it, it's amazing. So, you know, happy, not perfect, upgrade your mind, challenge your thoughts and free yourself from anxiety. Now, for me, I've talked about this a lot on this podcast. Anxiety for me is why I started the capsule. It's really kind of why I wanted to take it in a, a well-being direction. Um, Because it's, it's really hard to understand, you know, it's, it's taken a lot of lived experience from you, as you said, to get to the point of publication and you have been incredibly honest, but you know, it's not like you started off with this incredibly difficult childhood or something that was particularly traumatic. You learn what you call your core beliefs through very normal kind of situations, really. I mean, if you take me back to that time. Yeah, and that's a really important point that you kind of made, which is, you know, life ha- gives us like micro wounds, like, and 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 so, and I actually, I was, when I was writing the book, I had this kind of imposter syndrome feeling almost even when I was writing it, being like, oh, well, have you gone through enough to be able to write about this and the way that it affected you? And uh, oh, are you just oversensitive that that breakup really upset you for so many years afterwards? And, and often we like unvalidate actually very normal experiences that leave a mark on us and and so in the book I talk about these core beliefs and again you would think oh well you know okay being a bit of an average child what's so wrong with that but that just gave me such a such a strong belief that I wasn't good enough as I was and I had to be better to fit in or I had to be better to be more I had to be in just 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 more um if I was going to do anything and that over years like every single day of these core beliefs being reminded to you and as I write in the book our brain has this thing called confirmation bias so because our brain wants to feel like it's safe in the world it likes to find evidence to confirm our core beliefs so if so my core belief was well I didn't think I was enough 
So my brain thought it was being really clever by finding all the evidence to remind myself that I wasn't enough. And obviously, you can imagine what the, what that does to your self esteem, like you are, you know, the, 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 then how you behave in work environments or relationships. You're coming from a place of just you know not feeling very good about yourself, and um, but it's it's so powerful. And for me, it was totally life changing having that time just to bring myself, like just to bring that awareness to what was driving the way I was behaving because we have a feeling that leads to thoughts and then that leads to action. But if the action like behavior that you think oh, that's not truly me, I'm being a bit controlling or mm. I'm seeking so much reassurance all the time, but actually it probably when you stem it back comes from a very normal experience, which as a child, maybe you misunderstood and then turned that into a core belief. And this is the thing that like, you talk a lot about in the book, which I think so many people struggle with. So many people that I'm not good enough. I think that really crosses the board for lots of different people and the rejection that people feel from that and how they then beat themselves up and then they work harder and then it becomes more desperate. And then you're in this never ending cycle of like trying so hard, it not getting something and then it, and then it just eats you up. And like for you, and this is where it, it was very similar for me in, in your book was you kind of, rather than looking inside, became a bit of a workaholic in the form of an addiction almost. And I think, again, so many people do that. I mean, you, you know, talk me through that period where you were just working so hard to kind of as an avoidance tactic. Mm -hmm. It's so odd when you talk about daily addictions like almost work becoming an addiction because we're so conditioned to think addiction, oh, that must mean drugs or alcohol. But as addiction expert Mandy Seligman writes, an addiction is any behavior outside of ourselves we use to fix an internal wound. So for me, I, as you said, turned, I didn't feel very good. I didn't feel very good about myself. Okay. But if I work harder, I'll be more successful and then people will have to like me then. And then, you know, then I'll feel safe and then I'll have money. And then all of these things that I felt would give me that feeling of enoughness. And so the worse I felt about myself, I then decided, well, I'm going to get another job or the job that I have right now is not good enough. I need to find something more. And, you know, I come from like a background, my, you know, my dad is, um, he's kind of a, a, an entrepreneur. And so as growing up, he would say, well, work so hard, it hurts. And I then took that on as like the way that I live my life. If I wasn't almost so exhausted at the end of the day, then I wasn't working hard enough. And it's it's a it's a mentality that I feel I am more I've spoken to people that is it's very kind of like British in a way mm. in the sense that we just in a way you start to feel guilty if you're relaxing I used to think that if I booked a nice treatment for myself or like a massage was oh my god that was like really spoiling and maybe only for my birthday like there was this guilt of like looking after yourself and this feeling that I had to be working myself to the bone, otherwise I wasn't working hard enough. And what ha happened is, of course, nothing external can change a feeling internally. So that feeling of safety, that feeling of recognition, that feeling of like just craving for a well done never came. And my body broke down because at some point, it doesn't matter how much our insecurities are driving our behavior, our actual physical body, and that's why we get sick, my immune system was so low and broken because I was on such stress overload and when we're stressed we release the cortisol hormone which then lowers our immune system it like reduces our digestion and so suddenly I was so painfully bloated I remember there was a period of maybe two years I couldn't fit into any gene and it was my stomach was like a balloon it was so hard like whenever I even like touched it so full of air the entire time and it's because my digestion had totally stopped because in my mind, I was on fight and flight. I was in danger detection mode the entire time. And if it wasn't for my body totally breaking and ended up in actual having to go see, having to go to a, the hospital as in America at the time, I'm not sure I would have stopped because I would have still listened 
to these insecurities running my show. And these core beliefs, as you said, you know, um, you know, I must point out, you know, you were traveling from LA back to London. You were doing a show with Snapchat, Pillow Talk. You were also working on, you know, Pop and Suki, which is your fashion brand. And then you were developing Happy Not Perfect in its, in its infancy. So you were doing a lot, an awful lot of stuff of traveling, of being here. And you're only 27, you know, at that time. And so to have reached that point of complete exhaustion because I think some people don't actually believe that burnout exists but it really does it really manifests itself in a total kind of body almost giving up and going I just physically can't do anymore to the point as you said where you actually had to go to hospital and in that time whilst you were in hospital you know there's parts in the book where again you're very honest and you're forced almost to look at why you driven yourself to that point. And it was then when you started to kind of delve into that world that the science behind it kind of popped up, which for me was a game changer because I was like, ah, oh, this is how I think, you know, that bitchy critic Regina that you refer to, and we've all got one of them. And how can we reprogram her to stop talking so badly to us? And, you know, just tell me a bit about your scientific kind of um, uh, developments that you found out. Well, I think knowing how, well, beginning to learn how my mind worked changed everything for me because actually people talk about, oh, we need to be kind to ourselves. But even though we know we should be kind to ourselves, it's actually quite difficult to get there. But suddenly when I started to understand the science, I began to realize that, of course, I, I ended up here. Of course, I'm so stressed. And it's an, a quote that I often refer to is the human ability to create is so much faster than the human ability to adapt. So sometimes we're in create, create, create mode or even just the world in a collective way. We're like trying to create faster technology or we're trying to you know make faster planes and faster trains. And our brains are actually quite primitive. They haven't changed that much for thousands of years. And so we can't, our brain can't really handle the amount of information that we are having to consume every single day or we can't actually handle this like these enormous expectations we set for ourselves and so of course it it would make total sense that our immune system just gives in and so for me learning about the brain I started to learn that there was really just two main centers in like very basic terms like the emotional center of the brain and then the computer side like the wise the wise old owl some people call it and then you have the monkey side of the brain now I had lived my life completely with the monkey driving my car and let's say our brain is like a car the car never stops we never stop thinking so when people say about meditation oh you're going to stop your thoughts it's kind of impossible to stop your thoughts you know you may have a brief pause but our thoughts are kind of like you know they're kind of like waves in the ocean they just kind of like keep going or whatever and um but but we can kind of choose i guess the part of the brain that is controlling this car the monkey is just totally emotional. It and emotions are, are are really based on historic events. So whatever has happened to us, m- macro or minor, it is stored in our subconscious. So when you're driving your car and you uh, see something uh, new, your memory subconscious will say, "Oh, have I seen this before?" and bring out an historical experience to inform a reaction. But that is purely based by the monkey saying, "Am I safe? Am I not? Am I safe? Am I not?" It's always asking that question. The computer side of the brain, the wise old owl is actually where all our wisdom lies but the problem is is that it's quite lazy so it will stay in the back of the car for as long as possible until it's really asked to drive (laughs) the car instead of the monkey and so this was like game changing when I started to work this out because I suddenly was like oh my god in work meetings in my personal life I have been I had been in reactionary mode the entire time just like oh my god am I safe am I not reacting in ways I kind of regretted afterwards because I wasn't really thinking I was so in such a rush to do everything so worried I was missing out again my monkey was driving like a maniac now when you learn to switch on that prefrontal cortex that computer side the wise old owl by doing things like a belly breath or going for a walk or journaling or just by even labeling your emotion as studies have found you actually kick the monkey to the back of the car 
And then your wise old owl that is super intelligent, like a badass CEO, is then driving your car. So when you suddenly come to a moment where you may have been, you may have seen it before, you may have not seen it before, you pause, you ask yourself, hmm, how do I want to respond to this? And you bring all the wisdom that you have and all the things that you've gone through and all the advice and all the amazing things that your brain has stored um, that is going to help you react to the situation the best way possible for you and the future you want to create. That's what happens when you're a bit more relaxed, when you're going a bit slower. The wise old owl is controlling how your car drives. And suddenly when I worked out, I was, I've been using the emotional part of my brain up until now in that fight and flight. I wasn't surprised that I was burnt out, I wasn't surprised that I was in hospital, I wasn't surprised that I was constantly getting frustrated by, with myself or saying things I was regretting or, you know, making decisions or saying yes when I, when I meant no and being a people pleaser and like all of these things. I was like, oh, why do I keep getting myself stuck in patterns I don't want to be in? And that comes to as well, like that whole um, need for for acceptance, which is what was really driving you was love me, kind of accept me, want me, don't reject me. And and once you once you get to the root of like, okay, so this is the driver, and now I've realised like once I change that bit, then everything else I don't have to be as reactionary to this because now I can step away change that first driver into something else and then like as you said you'll have the time to step back it is incredibly hard to do you know but when you read about it it's it's amazing and very enlightening if you have been on that path of being emotional and reactionary because you are craving something you know and, and unfortunately many of us are but we have to do that it's almost like step by step work and then you've now created which i think is amazing this like flex framework of making your mind be bendy rather than fixed so just talk to me a bit more about that yeah so I developed the flex because when I was beginning to think okay what's a healthy mindset for me to be in it's one that is able to move with me through life but actually and what happens when I'm reacting or stuck in old core beliefs that's very a stiff mindset mm -hmm. and so the so flexible thinking the flex is to really help you bend stiff core beliefs that aren't serving you anymore and at the bottom of all human beings, we all have the same needs. We all need to feel loved, safe, and a feeling of belonging. So we all look different on the surface and we all try to almost achieve those needs through different ways. So if mine was working really hard for somebody else, it could be, you know, I don't know, like needing affirmation in a different way. But fundamentally, we're all the same. And suddenly when you realize that we are all the same, it really takes away so much judgment that you can have on other people and their behavior because you realize that all of us just are, are just wanting to feel safe, to be honest. So the flex helps you, I guess, A, make better decisions, but B, activate that wise part of the brain more often than not. So it's made up of four steps. C, connection, second C, curiosity, third C, choice, and fourth C, commitment. And sometimes you may need just one of those steps, one of the Cs. You just need to connect with yourself rather than being in autopilot mode uh, when the monkey is driving your car. Or you may need to actually focus on step three, which is the choice. I choose to be kind to myself. And that is where our power lies. And there's a quote by Victor, Victor Frankl, which I always go back to. And um, and he talks about how there is a space between reaction and response. And in that space, that is our power where we get to manifest the future that we want. And a lot of people talk about manifestation as this idea of like, we are manifesting the future. Oh, think about what you want in the future. But real manifestation happens in the present happens in how you choose to respond to what life throws at you because you have the ability to, ch to change to completely turn the situation around by taking something what you think isn't great and actually turn it into the best thing ever for you like breakups I find that they can like rock your world split you open but actually to me every single breakup has been 
the greatest period of transformation in my life. It's like I can literally look back and go, oh, wow, that was that breakup that totally sent me on another path. <gasps> my God, that was that breakup that really gave me that time of total kind of like self-inquiry to like really look inside. And um, but it's the it's the choice. How do we choose to turn struggle into an opportunity? And to me, that is the most fascinating thing in life. And that is the difference between sinking and swimming. And that happens so much as well in marriage, I think. I think how you choose to, um, you know, tackle a situation or a bump that could happen in your marriage is a huge thing because my husband and I have been together, uh, we've been married for 13 years, we've been together for 17, and we've been up and down many, many times. But I would say that we're in a healthier place now because of the reflection and the ch- what we're going to choose to do in this moment, we can either choose to part or we can choose to really dig deep, look at what brought us here and move forward and then actually see it as a positive that we had that experience because now it's allowed us to a bit more understanding with each other. So I think, again, that choice mindset and that flexible thinking is it's hard to practice, but once you do practice it, it then helps everything else and it stops you being in that stiff mindset. Um, some of the other things that you write about, you know, a little bit later on in the book is the um, the fear of, you know, um, comparison and being compared to people. And there's, I think I just got a little quote about it here. Which one is, oh yeah, the fear of other people's opinions, for poor which I think some, I suffer from that all the time. The faux pas is kills me nearly of like, what do other people think of me? And actually, again, we need to turn that around, don't we, on its head and flex our minds to think, well, actually what they think of me isn't always that important. You know, talk me through that section. My gosh, FOPO is something that, <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, it's one of those things that doesn't necessarily go away immediately, but it's even us drawing our awareness to the fact that we care about other people's opinions is so powerful because it allows us when we then fall into those thought worms of like, what do they think? Oh my God, are they annoyed with me on that phone call? Did I say something stupid? I don't think I meant that. Oh no, are they upset? Should I send them a message just to make sure they're not upset? Like literally this is kind of like- spiral. (laughs) My internal dialogue of like, have I upset them? Have I not? Like, do you, did I hug them up like enough? Like, you know, just the most ridiculous things. Um, but again, in moderation, it it we are social creatures. Of course, we're going to care about people we love and what they think of us. But there is, and this is where this line between it's important and then actually it's unhelpful is a blurry line. And so actually, when does this serve us? And then when does it limit us? And when you ask yourself this question like okay is this making me my best self right now and you're like no it's like okay let's go back to the flex method so one of the really important steps with flex when it comes to fopo is curiosity and one of my inspirations is byron katie and her four questions that make up the work and because often when we are in a narrative story of thinking what other people think of us, we're, we're usually wildly wrong. It's like, oh, we are kind of blending our insecurity and our fear on what we think others might be thinking. And so the four questions are really helpful. Question one, is this true? Let's say, is this true? Natalie thinks I'm a terrible podcast guest. Okay, <laughs> let's just go for that. Is this true? It's like, oh, I'll come off this and go, well, yeah, it is. You know, you really rambled and blah, blah, blah. Okay, second question. Can you be 100% sure it's true that she thought this? Well, no, I can't be 100% sure because I can't look into her mind and I don't know what she's thinking. And yeah, I can't be 100% sure. How does this thought make you feel? Well, it makes me feel insecure, makes me feel like low energy, makes me doubt myself. Um, yeah, it makes me feel even more fearful, fopoing even more. Who would you be without this thought? Fourth question. Well, I'd be happy, energized, feeling good, in alignment, uh, motivated to do something else. And suddenly you realize through these four questions that the root of our suffering usually lies within our thoughts that we don't even know are true. So when we come back to truth, it is so powerful because then we can release ourselves 
from narratives that are not serving us. Oh my God. And this is the thing, isn't it? It just, and like you just said then, all those things that you were saying, that has often been my internal dialogue of, and then panicking and then becoming reactionary and then allowing the monkey to get in the car. And you're like, ah, and it just becomes this circle of never ending, like internal mess. But when you, I think as well, when, when you are, validated by science almost when you feel like actually there is a scientific reason that I'm feeling this way and also that means then that I have a choice to change that because you know I can choose to change this I don't have to stick with this mindset this has been conditioned into me as we said at the beginning from being very young those core beliefs that were instilled in us as a child. So now you can choose actually to recondition your thinking. It takes work and practice, but it can be done. And when I understood that from your book and was like, I don't have to be in this mindset all the time. I can actually move on from this. I can stop being an anxious person. And I can be a person that, yes, suffered with anxiety at one point, but I don't need it to rule the rest of my life. I can actually choose to change this. I think that was the most helpful part for me. And I think I'm sure it would be for other people knowing that they don't have to be stuck in this moment. It takes work, but you can change it. That's right. Yeah. Literally like, oh, I want to kind of like cry. It's like so right. And I think that's probably what motivates me so much in this work because I was so stuck too. I was so like I identified so much with an emotional identity, like I'm an anxious person. And actually none of us, no one's an anxious person. No one's an angry person. No one's a, no, no one's a, a, a nothing person. We are human beings experiencing emotions that always pass. And so the diffusion technique that I write about in the book, when we say a small sentence like, today my mind feels whew, a bit anxious. But just by saying that, we remind ourselves, today emotions are only temporary. My mind we are not our emotion. And then we label the emotion, which actually helps to um, calm down that emotional center and put that wise old owl back in the car seat. Like that's a really simple tool. And then the 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 compassion like tool, asking yourself a simple question like, what would I advise a friend experiencing what I am now? What would I advise a friend experiencing what I am now? And suddenly we realize we can give really good advice to our friends, Mm -hmm. but yet we're so bad at advising ourselves. And what's so amazing about that question when you're you're thinking as if, well, what would I tell a friend experiencing what I am now? You actually get the wise old owl to answer the question and the emotional monkey like goes to sleep. And so you're just using different parts of your brain to look at the situation with a different perspective. And so the cool thing of flexible thinking is expanding your awareness and knowing that you can stretch to a new perspective because the way that we interpret the world can change. And that is like, has been the most liberating thing ever for me. Oh, and me as well. Honestly, I'm me. I've recommended your book to nearly like everyone because all of my friends have had an anxious moment at some point and overthinking and overstressing. But, you know, like you've developed this incredible app. You have, you know, you've got an amazing podcast. And so just tell me a little bit more now about actually the other services that you have on the app, on the website and within your podcast so that, you know, if people just need that daily reminder of, of so they're not on their own doing this because that's the thing is going well where do I start I could get your book and everything but now what what do I do next so just tell me a little bit more about the platform itself so the app um, we created the happiness workout the sleep wind down and the manifesting workout and it's basically really to answer that question which is okay what can we do every day because there's one thing knowing which is a huge stat that's like 80 percent and then you've got a really important like 20 percent, which is the doing and it's really easy to like be inspired and then suddenly we kind of 
are not training our mind muscles to work for us when we're actually on the field. So I always think kind of like the, the England football team would never go on that pitch without training outside of the pitch. Mm. And it's the same thing with our mind and life. Like we've got to keep training when we're off the pitch because then when we're actually, you know, in life, in the middle of work, like in the middle of conversations or whatever, all that training that we've done for our mind to like have great access to the wise old owl part of our brain, like in moments of like, of, you know, of, of like kind of, um, I wouldn't say crisis, but do you know what I mean? Like those hot moments of life yeah. when we can so easily like be reactive, but actually to just pause and like give ourselves that patience to like assemble the wisdom for us to then respond in the way we want to. That really happens. That training happens when we really commit to daily activities. So the app is all about like daily rituals that you can do and it's all based on science. And so the sleep wind down, that's an easier one to fit into your day because it's like, oh, you know, when you're going to sleep, you can do that. It takes less than five minutes and you get to release any worries for the day, set a goal, have a moment of gratitude, have a moment of compassion and you're done. But also what I would say with all of this stuff, like, don't set yourself crazy things to do like this idea that we can all meditate for an hour like for me totally unrealistic <laughs> you know and I think sometimes and I have to be really careful of this we can become perfectionists over wellness which yeah. is ridiculous because the whole thing is supposed to help us kind of like not have to be such perfectionists in life like it doesn't really matter what we look like and it doesn't really matter like if we make a mistake and we all fuck up and it's kind of like embracing that is like you know for me it was like part like a really big key part of the journey um so I would say when you are carrying on this work again like if you miss a couple of days it's fine and if you like go back and be really reactionary on something again that's fine but when you just have the awareness that oh you know what I was a bit like hot-headed in that moment that shows you the progression because you've actually been aware of something you've done and you know and and celebrate those small wins and where do you want to take you know happy not perfect next because it's it's such an incredible platform and like the work that you're doing as you said we can especially if you've got that that kind of um personality where you are prone to perfectionism I know I definitely am like again the same like work being a workaholic perfectionist and but yet allowing yourself to go no it's fine I'm all right to fail. It's okay. It's not a failure even. It's an opportunity. Where, like All of the things that you're doing are so brilliant. Where are you hoping to go next with it? Well, hopefully I would just would love to do more kind of um, like group group things because I do really think that this, even just talking about it with you, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it, this has been so healing for me as well because it's so nice to have like-minded people who care about the same things because then we can help each other, like, you know, just stay in alignment with like our truest self. And I think that's a, that's become a really big thing for me, like recently is, is helping other people as well as myself to stay in alignment with themselves because it's so easy for us to fall into like oh I should do that or I should do that like fall into other people's expectations of us like past or present or even future but actually finding our true our true north because that's when we feel like that wonderful feeling of self-trust and acceptance and and maybe life doesn't exactly look how you would have put it on paper but there's a feeling of it being good and like you're in the right place at the right time and that gooey feeling of like something feels really right about this moment and that's what I'm really keen to help people to find because I've been so wildly off course and when I'm so wildly off course that's usually where my anxiety has been the worst too because anxiety is just a signpost to say hey 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 over there mm -hmm. like I'm not sure you're on the right path like like slow down and potentially take a pivot or potentially like something right now is 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 not right and the anxiety is there to tell us um and then suddenly and don't get me wrong sometimes this, this can like mean I don't know changing jobs or it can mean like doing something different and we don't really want to do something different and it can often put us out of our comfort zone um but then we suddenly then move into alignment again and we're like oh 
that's what the anxiety was about. It was trying to tell me I was maybe going in the wrong direction. And so I'm hoping, so, I mean, if you people just find me on social media, I'm trying to, that's kind of like my plan for the next few months. Like, you know, I spent like six years researching the book, developing the app and just how can I make sure that more people have this, this, this space, really create space in their life to find their true alignment because that's when everyone also collectively that's when we're we're like in our highest vibration and that's not only good for us it's good for everybody around us because we're the best versions of ourselves and so we can you know be even like you know uplifting for other people and so all of this work is is actually selfless because I think it um it benefits everyone and I just want to ask you um as well you know um about social media and young people because you have an app which is tech you know and tech can be amazing but tech can also be really damaging as well and I think it's important isn't it that basically like the work that you're doing filters down into young kids even young children because I didn't have all these tools like that you've talked about in this book I didn't know any of that it's taken me to get to 40 years old to read your book and go ah you know and I would love for for, you know my son son's only nine at the minute but you know, what is your reaction and, and your opinion even of um, young people and social media and how they need to be mindful or if you're a parent, how you can help them navigate that kind of world? So I think with children, it's, I mean, I think they are, are being born in such a great time because we have way more awareness of this kind of social emotional education and this this emotional intelligence that nobody is born with. I always say that nobody's born to be a flexible thinker. You learn to be a flexible thinker. And that's the same for children as well. Like every child can learn in a way kind of healthy emotional regulation. So the happiness workout is something that's really great for kids to do alongside you because you have that moment where in a game like format, it's asking, okay, choose your emotion. How do we feel today? Like even just asking a child, say, well, but how do you feel today? It actually opens up conversation that you may not have because you, it's so easy to fall into the monotony of every day of like, okay, you got soccer practice, blah, 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 blah. but actually having that moment where you get to process the day, how you feel and they get to choose their emotion. Why, why are they feeling like that? What are they ready to let go of or they just get a moment to express and and I think it's the the same with adults sometimes we don't need a solution we just need space to process just need space to explore how we feel just to have that awareness we don't necessarily need a fix there's not necessarily anything wrong we just need to share and then having that moment of like in the app for example it gives you a moment of oh what can we be grateful for today or we ask that compassion question like what would we tell a friend experiencing what I am now and these same tools that are so helpful for every age you're like teaching these children from such a young age to know that they can belly breathe every time they feel a bit nervous like nervous before an exam or nervous before talking in front of the class like it's it's such a universal education and all it is is really helping us uh, manage our very kind of like the way that humans have been built with this fight and flight and with this rest and relax system we're just moderating like what mode we're in and I think it is important that we do have those conversations now particularly with things like social media because you know you did an amazing talk about um the uh, being addicted to likes and that I already worry about that with my son about oh did anybody like it I'm like I've even I've actually now disabled comments and things on any of his devices and his like um games that he's on because I don't want him worrying about what his other nine or ten year old friends think of him I don't want him sat at night going well what did they mean by that I know as, as a 40 year old woman kind of what how that made me feel you know just even with friends I don't want him getting into that cycle. And so I think it is important that we do have those conversations with our children to make sure they can understand the difference between digital and what people might say online to what is actually happening in real life. That's, would you agree? Couldn't agree more. I went, the TED talk I did like six years ago now, Addicted to Likes. I remember at the time the conversation around the fact that likes obviously 
manipulate our brain chemistry. They give us the dopamine release. So it feels good. And so this is why it's very easy for children to also become very addicted to their games or social media, because as you said, like it kind of makes them feel good. And then they don't get the same response the day afterwards. And they're like, Oh, but, but why? And so they, it becomes like highly addictive, but I think you're so right in just again, like helping them have that awareness of people behave very differently online and also explaining to them what even like a uh, bullying behavior is and where it comes from. And the fact that like everyone is searching the same, that everybody wants to feel loved and often a bully, does, a bully is someone who is not getting enough love in their life is just really healthy conversations because again, we're helping them to, regulate their emotions mm -hmm. and also regulate that internal references referencing to external referencing like when we are looking for validation in our external environment it will always leave us feeling short so to teach and nurture children to actually trust their own intuition trust how that felt to them before needing someone else to say that's good or that's bad is i think one of the healthiest skills that we can like teach them but inevitably we, you know, we've all learned from experience. And I think it's that um, the same thing for children, like someone says, you know, you can't rob someone of their journey. We also have to kind of allow, allow for everyone to kind of go through their bruises, because also, like, when we look back, we probably wouldn't have taken away some of the times because it's made us who we are today. Oh, yeah, you're so right. As a parent, it's so hard, though, but that is absolutely right. Honestly, you're totally brilliantly right on that one. Now, this series, I'm asking all of my guests, what would be one thing that they could add into our well-being capsule? Now, it can be a product or a practice, but it comes highly recommended by you. So what would you put into our well-being capsule? A daily dance. Um, just as soon as you wake up, I, talk, I write about it in the flex step one, connect with your mind, connect with your body. And the easiest way to do that is dance like no one is watching or everybody is watching. Um, and I honestly, I just put on my favorite tune, some like 70s number, and I just dance around, around my bedroom for like five minutes. And it is like the greatest mood boost, especially when you've like, especially when it kind of like comes to like winter months, like nobody wants to get out of bed and just like putting on your favorite music, even to get you out of bed mm. and having a bit of a boogie totally game changing oh that is brilliant oh thank you so much sadly poppy we oh my gosh total pleasure and thank you so much for reading the book it means the world Bye. This episode of the Capsule in Conversation was brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Bottled at source, Harrogate Spring offers a pure, refreshing taste with a delicate blend of naturally occurring minerals and electrolytes, perfect for healthy hydration.